Kontestacja. Good evening to everybody who's listening. This is Contestacja Internet Radio promoting freedom and entrepreneurship t- since 2009. Uh, my name is uh, Krzysztof Maczyński, uh, or Chris for short. That's the English equivalent of my name by which you, you may call me or by my nickname by it by Iter. I'm broadcasting from Bielska Biała and we're starting a live uh, show Gość Miesiąca, which is in English um, Guest of the Month. Uh, Today's edition is uh, doubly special. Uh, the first reason why it is special is that, um, in contrary to all previous episodes, we have two guests uh, who are um, now in Albania. Uh, Glenn Kreip. Glenn, are you with us? Hello, everyone. And Andy Aishan. <clears throat> yeah, good evening, Chris. Pleasure to be on contestadia.com. Uh, Glenn is the executive director and Andy is uh, uh, the director of uh, the Language of Liberty Institute, which is uh, uh, best known for organizing Liberty English camps. And that's one of the things that we'll be talking about uh, today uh, and also about the other activities of this organization. Uh, This is a live show. Uh, and uh, there is another reason uh, it's special, uh, because uh, it's in English, as you may have noticed already, uh, unlike any previous episode again. And we encourage you to interact with us during the show. You can join us uh, on on text chat, which is as at uh, chat.contestacia.com. I'll spell it for those of you who may not know how to write it. Uh, so it's uh, C-Z-A-T dot uh, k-o-n-t-e-s-t-a-c-j-a dot c-o-m and you can also join us on air you can call us uh, using either Skype or a telephone Uh, for Skype use the Skype uh, username contestacia.com the same as for chat but uh, without the first part contestacia.com and if you want to call in by phone uh, then dial 222-195-321. 222-195-321. I repeat, 222-195-321. Um, uh, if you're calling from an abroad uh, device, uh, pref- pre- prefix it with uh, plus 48. That's for Poland. Uh, and um, before, before we begin, um, we have uh, something that uh, we promote because... Uh, um, we, contest, we at Contestacja Internet Radio are partners of this, um, well, of this series of event of this uh, course, which is the Polish American Leadership Academy, organized by the Freedom and Entrepreneurship Foundation. And now um, we'll listen to a promo of that uh, academy. na Akademię. Fundacja Wolności i Przedsiębiorczości oraz Language of Liberty Institute zapraszają na Polsko-Amerykańską Akademię Liderów. Projekt edukacyjny trwający od października do stycznia skierowany do młodych wolnościowców chcących zaangażować się w życie publiczne. W programie cztery moduły. Komunikacja społeczna, ekonomia austriacka, filozofia polityki, etyka gospodarcza. Zajęcia prowadzą m.in. eksperci Instytutu Misesa. Dla najlepszych staż w Goldwater Institute i Fundacji Wolności i Przedsiębiorczości oraz bezpłatny udział w wolnościowych seminariach za granicą. Szczegóły i zapisy na akademialiderow.edu.pl Poleca patron medialny Kontestacja Radio Ludzi Wolnych. As I said, this is a live hearing, so we can call in at any time. And we'll also ask uh, our guests, uh, Glenn Kreip and Andy Eichen uh, of the Language of Liberty Institute, uh, the most interesting questions uh, from chat. And also questions that you uh, sent us by email. You, uh, we announced this uh, um, 
this episode and uh, t- told you that you could send us questions by email. So there are some questions from us, some questions from you sent by email, and some questions you may ask uh, interactively now uh, during the show. So, Glenn and Andy, are you ready for the first question? Yes, yes. we're ready, Krzysztof. Yes, and thank you for inviting us, Krzysztof. It's a real pleasure. Dobrzeczer to everybody. Uh, to begin with, please introduce yourselves uh, with more detailed backgrounds. Where do you come from? What have your walks of life been? And how did you reach the decision of becoming libertarian activists and founding the uh, Language of Liberty uh, Institute, or LLI for short? Uh, yes, uh, I am uh, American. I was born in the Chicago area. Um, I have lived in many different places in the U.S., including uh, California. I currently live in Phoenix, Arizona. My background is uh, I, uh, at university, I studied foreign languages and economics and finance. Uh, For uh, work, most of my work experience is in uh, IT. I was a software developer, a consultant, and uh, training, uh, teaching programming languages uh, for many, many years. And a few years ago, I was looking for a different kind of project. Uh, I was looking for a way to be more active in spreading the philosophy and the ideas of freedom. So I talked to some friends and uh, I met Andy at a, at a conference and we decided to organize Language of Liberty Institute. And I, I think we had a similar idea at the time, which is uh, we've spent many years going to conferences and reading books and discussing with friends, but we want to be more active. We want to do something more, uh, less talk and more action. Well, so now our current project involves a lot of talking, but also a lot of action and travel, uh, meeting a lot of new people, wonderful people all over the world. We formed, officially formed, Language of Liberty Institute in 2005. We incorporated as a nonprofit corporation in the state of Arizona, where I live, and uh, we have expanded our activities every year. Our primary activity being our uh, Liberty English camps. Sometimes we call them Liberty seminars. It depends on the duration. Uh, and the location. Uh, thanks, uh, Andy. <laughs> yes, good evening. The same question, uh, the same question for yes. you. Yes, uh, I was actually born in Luxembourg, here in Europe. And uh, I think I have always uh, yearned for my personal freedom. I left school when I was uh, still young, 16. I did not finish my high school. And uh, I went for a holiday to, uh, to Florida. And after I um, experienced uh, Florida, the beautiful weather, and uh, what struck me most was the, the freedom that uh, the Americans seem to enjoy compared to um, us uh, Europeans, and especially in Luxembourg, which is a very small country where everybody knows everybody and where the social pressures are very high. So um, I applied to uh, get my green card, but um, after two years, uh, I still hadn't received it, and so I gave up and I applied to go to Australia uh, instead. And I was accepted there, and today I am an Australian uh, citizen. In uh, 1975, when Australia had a political crisis, I got involved in uh, politics and uh, I was a founding member of a libertarian uh, party. And uh, I actually ran for parliament myself in uh, 1980. I was not successful in that uh, endeavor, uh, but I, I stayed connected with the libertarian movement. Um, but I concentrated more on business and I became a consultant and I started my own uh, independent consultancy uh, in Australia in uh, 1987. And uh, in 1991, I left Australia and uh, I heard about this concept of permanent tourism. And I decided that that was for me. 
And uh, so in 1992, I became a permanent tourist, which means I still have my Australian citizenship, but uh, I no longer have a permanent residence. And uh, I've been traveling the world ever since. And uh, like Len said, in 2004, we happened to meet uh, in Lithuania at a Liberty camp. And uh, one year later, we decided that uh, we should form our own institute and we should take this concept of the Liberty Camp, uh, not just to Lithuania, but to uh, countries around the world, so wherever young people were interested to find out more about personal freedom. And uh, we've been doing that ever since. Great. Another question is uh, quite simple. Um, um, how many people are there in the institute uh, and are they fully paid employees, uh, volunteers or both kinds? Well, uh, Ed, we are a, a very wide, loose network of people around the world. Uh, we don't have employees. Uh, Andy and I uh, currently both donate our time. Uh, for me, it's a, a full-time work. It's my primary project. Uh, Andy also devotes a lot of time. We are, uh, as we expand, uh, as we grow, uh, we will, uh, we do need to uh, start paying ourselves uh, because this has become a, a, a very a major and very important project. But we don't do it alone. We rely on uh, local partners in every country. We work with uh, local partners, and we work with other other teachers, other discussion leaders, other guest speakers. At this point, they they all are volunteers. They they donate their time, uh, often a lot of time, to making the camps successful. Uh, so uh, I, I would just add a special thanks to everyone who has been involved in in Poland and all the other countries where we have held our camps. Uh, so a number, uh, it's hard to give you an exact number, uh, uh, at least two dozen uh, people have played significant and continue to play a significant part in our operation. Uh, but as I said there, everybody's a volunteer and it's part time. Uh, okay, so great. Uh, it's, uh, it's been, uh, well, um, the cooperation between you must be incredibly um, efficient and reliable uh, since you're able to run such a major project um, based on just this number of people globally. Uh, yes, it, it really is. And uh, we could not do what we do without, without the help, uh, all, without the work of all our local partners. And I hope some of them are, are listening tonight and hear once again our appreciation of this. Uh, we also have uh, friends in the States and in other countries who support us in other ways. Uh, they uh, Sometimes they attend camps, sometimes they give presentations, sometimes they help us raise money, they help us publicize, uh, they help us write material. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of activity. Uh, Andy and I do a lot, but we don't do everything. We can't do everything. Uh, and so, so, yes, you're right. This is a, it's, it's huge. Uh, one way of looking at it is in each country where we operate, we have a project manager uh, and then uh, I am the manager of all of these project managers. Uh, this year we went to eight different countries, uh, so that means eight different uh, individuals, usually, uh, usually young people in their 20s, they're students, they are young professionals, uh, sometimes they're with uh, think tanks. Uh, or other organizations, and uh, uh, it, eight, it grows every year. <laughs> those eight countries include Poland and Albania, where you're now. Uh, yes. And you, uh, you, you're there, you're there uh, for a Liberty English camp uh, that's just uh, ended, right? Y yes, that's right. We had a three-day, and this time we called it a seminar because... Uh, when we call it a camp, usually it gives the idea that we are out in the country or in cabins or at a lake or something, and often we do that. But th this time it was in the city of Tirana. It was in a classroom at a, a private school, a new school, and we had uh, 22 students. Uh, we spent uh, three days. We just finished yesterday evening. Uh, 
the week before we were in, as you know, we were in uh, Krakow. Uh, all we had a, a two-day seminar. I attended uh, it. Uh, where we had the pleasure of meeting you. Uh, so it, it was orga organized by the um, Fr Freedom and Entrepreneurship uh, Foundation, the same one that uh, in invites um, invites everybody um, who, who would like to uh, to the Polish American uh, Leadership Academy, as I said in the beginning. Yes, yes, and uh, earlier in the year. Well, last week was our second time in Poland because we were also there the first week of July. We had a four-day camp in uh, in Silesia, in uh, close to where you are now, uh, near the town of Milówka. Uh, earlier in the year, uh, okay. we went to Mozambique. We Let's went to... <laughs> well, that's the name of the region. Okay. Uh, okay. Mo Moz Mozambique, uh, in Africa. Yes, we went to Mozambique twice. We went in January. We went again in August. We also went to Kazakhstan, to Armenia, to Brazil, to Georgia Republic, to Slovakia, Georgia, Georgia, and Georgia and Republic, and Lithuania. And uh, we did not go to Lithuania, but friends of ours are uh, organized at least one camp every summer in Lithuania. Sometimes we're able to join them and uh, sometimes we're not able, uh, usually because we have another camp scheduled at that time. But uh, our friends in Lithuania actually started, uh, we were inspired by them and we met in Lithuania in 2004. So uh, Andy and I did not invent the concept of an English camp. Our friends started this in 1997. What Andy and I have done is uh, to uh, modify the, their original idea and find ways to expand in other countries. Uh, so our friends continue to organize the camp in Lithuania and uh, Andy and I are, have gone in a different direction, uh, taking our, our message and our program to as many countries and as many people as possible. No. Well, that uh, has brought us uh, in a natural way to uh, another question which you have already answered. Uh, so, um, the, um, the conversation is uh, developing in a, uh, is following its natural course uh, because I was going to ask you for a brief overview of this project. Uh, so, now uh, that's uh, uh, beyond us, uh, what are other activities of uh, the Institute? <clears throat> our, do our you do camps, anything else else than organizing camps and seminars? Uh, the camps and seminars are the major activity at the moment. We are, as we grow, we see some interesting new opportunities that we are uh, just starting to develop. And I think Andy would like to say something about that. <clears throat> yes, uh, one of these uh, ideas is the idea of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship, of course, is nothing new, but uh, we see today, especially among young people, uh, there is more desire to go and work, find jobs, go and work for large companies or even go and work for the government rather than uh, starting your own uh, business. So we try to promote in our seminars and in our camps, we promote the, the concept of uh, entrepreneurship, of for especially young people starting their own business instead of looking for a job why don't you go and create one first for yourself and then also for other people and um, in a camp where we have like a whole week where we have uh, more time uh, we get the students to sort of prepare a business plan and present it uh, back to us uh, on the last day of, of the camp and uh, this is just an exercise to get them to think like uh, an entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur, you have uh, many different things to, to, to take care of and to think about. And we would like to give them the opportunity to, to get a feel for what that's like. You have to think about uh, marketing. You have to think about selling. You have to think about uh, producing a product. Uh, you have to think about advertising. You have to... Uh, Think about the manufacturing or, or the delivery of your service and you have to look at the finances, where you're going to get your money, how you're going to make a profit, uh, all of these things. Uh, normally, in a normal classroom, you would not get that opportunity. 
But uh, in our in our camps, we try to give students uh, that opportunity just as an exercise. And if there is a or more students that has a concrete uh, business idea and they want to uh, or they have written a business plan, we are happy to uh, review those uh, business plans to give them tips uh, on how to improve, uh, maybe even put them in touch with uh, people who are in similar businesses or who have similar ideas or get them in touch with uh, so-called business angels who can provide uh, financing for startup uh, enterprises. So that's uh, that's another activity that we want to develop um, over, over time that we have started to do already. And uh, it's very encouraging to see young people being prepared to take risk, to uh, innovate, to come up with uh, new ideas and to have the courage. Uh, some um, yes, even their friends, their teachers, uh, to have the courage to go ahead and to uh, start their own business. So we, we strongly encourage that. Uh, Chris, maybe I could add a comment also. Uh, as our activities expand, we are finding uh, some very, very interesting ideas that we're starting to explore, uh, such as uh, opening schools or other training related training programs in uh, individual countries, especially big countries like Brazil or Nigeria um, with a big population and uh, we see a lot of opportunity there. There seems to be a, a great demand for the combination that we offer, which is English conversation practice, exploration of classical liberal ideas and workshops about how to implement these ideas in daily life. So it's part theory and part practice. It's part talking and part doing. Uh, there seems to be a, a big market. Uh, so we're starting to look beyond our standard program, uh, looking for, for ways to branch. So it's, it's, I, I can't tell you more because this is just the beginning, but it's, it's very, very, it's especially exciting to to see the demand for freedom, the demand for the ideas. Uh, this is a, something very different in, in our many years of experience where we, we have felt lonely. It's, it's very nice to find so many people, especially young people all over the world, some of whom also feel very lonely and who are very, very happy to meet others uh, like them and to be together for three, four or five days and explore these ideas. Excellent. And could you tell us uh, something about the torch? Uh, th you're referring to our newsletter, I assume. Right. Or just our symbol. <laughs> uh, well, it's also in your symbol, but I think the sy symbol came first and then uh, you started the newsletter. Or was it the other way around? Um, it, it was the same time. And the uh, the design, we have to uh, thank and give credit to our colleague Astrid Campos. Uh, she also she lives near me in Phoenix. So, uh, unlike most of our colleagues, we actually live in the same same city. Um, but she designed this, and she's in charge of the newsletter. The symbol we were inspired by the Statue of Liberty, which you can. Can probably I hope you can see from, from the logo, uh, you know the, yes. the symbol of freedom, the symbol of uh, you know light, knowledge, etc. Um, so friends we, to the United States. Yes, yeah, so we seemed like a good choice for the the newsletter. We publish the newsletter. It's not a fixed schedule. It's um, every two to three months. It sort of depends on our tr our travel schedule and uh, how much we think we have to say. Uh, we've done this for um, nearly two years, and we, uh, when I get back to the States uh, Wednesday, uh, that will be uh, a hot project to work on, is uh, the next issue of The Torch. And we will be talking about our camps in Poland and, and Albania. And you're listening to Gosz Miesiąca, uh, guest of the month, uh, with two guests of the month, uh, Glenn Kripe and Andy Eichen of the Language of Liberty Institute, um, a live show, a monthly show uh, on Contestacja Internet Radio. And a reminder for all our listeners that you may 
call us. You may call and uh, ask your questions or give your comments uh, using either Skype or a phone. With Skype, it's uh, username contestatia.com and uh, with a phone, it's number uh, optionally plus 48 if uh, from an abroad device uh, and then 222-195-321. Uh, I repeat, 222-195-321. Uh, please feel free to, to call at any time. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, I look up another question uh, for you. Um, what do you think about Ron Paul and his repeated efforts to gain more political power than his long head as a congressman? <laughs> I suppose I should answer. I'm doing too much talking, but I suppose I should, as the American, well, you, you are American in the room, obviously. I su <laughs> well, then we'll ask Andy for a uh, foreigner's perspective. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We we want to hear Andy's thoughts also. So, um, well, first of all, I'm very very happy that Ron Paul is doing everything he's doing. I think he is advancing the cause of liberty. There there are many ways to do that. Uh, I would choose Ron Paul's way. I'm not a politician. Uh, I'm not. I, I have no interest in being in Congress. Um, he's also a medical doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. You know, we we each have different talents, and we, uh, there are different ways of spreading freedom. Uh, so I'm a teacher, and I organize events. So I have my way. Uh, Ron Paul is doing something very, very, very important, uh, and and I think he has obviously succeeded in what I think is his mission, which is to publicize the ideas, to inspire young people, uh, to influence the Republican Party. Uh, the, the rules of the game in the U.S. pretty much require you to work within the two-party system, uh, whether that's good or bad. Uh, and Ron Paul has been more successful than any other libertarian I can think of in influencing in reaching more people and influencing them and influencing the party um so i you know i uh, it's it's sad to think that because he's 76 years old that he probably won't continue to do this too much longer because uh, we need him we, we need him to do these things uh he's he's been tremendous well uh, yeah, I, I that's the I think that's the the best thing I can say. You know, I I don't. He never expected to be elected president. I don't think he expected realistically to be nominated. But I think that's not so important. I think that what he I think he has achieved what he wanted to. Uh, and and the fact that we are discussing Ron Paul for a Polish audience, I think is tremendous testimony to his efforts. I'm not sure he realizes how many fans he has all over the world. So I, I think he's he's a great person. Well, if you meet him, tell him to come to Poland. I will gr greet him uh, very w warmly. Uh, but uh, well, you, sa you said he, he's trying to influence the, um, the um, Re Republican Party. Uh, this year he uh, ran for nomination with the Republican Party. Previously, he did it independently uh, with neither of the two major uh, parties. Uh, and uh, do you think it was the, the right step for him to take after what uh, happened in Tampa, Florida at the National uh, Republica, Re Republican Convention, uh, where, well, they knew from the from the beginning uh, that they're going to nominate Mitt Romney and uh, they just uh, well, they uh, actually didn't follow their due process, uh, violated it uh, in order to not even let Ron Paul get on the official ballot. Um, I, I can't really comment on the, the way things work internally with the Republicans. It appears that strange things were done um, and... That would be unfortunate. I, uh, but I think your question was, do I think he made the right decision to run for the Republican nomination? Uh, In, as opposed to doing it uh, on his own with neither of the two major parties. Uh, yes, or maybe even as a libertarian candidate. Uh, oh, I, I, uh, I, I think that Ron Paul believes he did the right thing, so I endorse that. 
Um, I, he he has tried for many for thirty years. He has tried many different ways of spreading the message, uh, and I think uh, I, I think he has had success in each way. But I think he had the most success by running for president. So I think it was a good move. Sure, yes. Uh. In, in, in terms of what I think are his goals and our goals as well, which is to spread the the freedom message and to inspire people. Well, then, then uh, the strategy of uh, running with a major party is perfectly uh, valid if he doesn't expect uh, to be even nominated well, anyway. Uh, he, he, yes, and, and I would add, uh, if a person's goal is to become president of the U.S., then you must be the candidate of a major party. An independent party, a third or fourth party candidate, will never become the president. It's uh, impossible with well, our for, system. For uh, like uh, two or three hundred years, there was a time uh, shortly when there were three major parties, but then two of them uh, joined together, and now there are two. Uh, Andy? Well, uh, yes, good point. Yeah, good point. Good point, yeah. But, uh, well... Uh, We shouldn't assume that it will stay like this forever. Um, mm -hmm. Would you? Uh, well, maybe an additional question, uh, Glenn, for you as an American. Would you welcome a change in this uh, in this system, uh, an emergence of uh, um, some other parties, one or more of them, uh, and uh, to have mo more than just two? Uh, yes, I think it would be a good idea. Uh, I, I think that there are advantages of having two major parties, uh, uh, advantages in comparison to, let's say, parliamentary democracies. Um, I think um, this probably isn't the right moment to try to describe the differences, but um, uh, they, they have, um, uh, making compromises, and instead of having many different factions trying to gain power... Uh, the factions have to compete within the party and reach agreements and compromises in order to become the heads of the parties. Um, I think there there are advantages to that. Uh, this was a, a controversy among our founders. Our, our founding fathers uh, were very suspicious of the idea of parties. So what we have today is probably not what they imagined. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I, what's important to me is that the system allows for change. Uh, I think it's less important whether we have two or three or four parties. I think what's more important is do we have a flexible system, a system that can adapt, a system that allows people with minority views, like Ron Paul, to have an influence, but not enough influence that they can wreck the system. So I'm um, sure, yeah. I mean, it, it, having more parties sounds like a good idea to me. Uh, Andy, what's your perspective as somebody who's not an American but uh, knows America <laughs> very well? <coughs> yes, um, I, Ron Paul is definitely the the most famous uh, libertarian politician, and uh, he has done more, I would say, than any other politician that I know of, of promoting the. the libertarian concepts the concepts of individual liberty and the responsibility of a free enterprise of uh, all governance and, and the benefits benefits from it uh, uh, Andy I'm afraid we can't hear you at the moment Uh, well, uh, th there seems there seems to be a problem with uh, and Andy's uh, connection. Maybe Glenn, you could tell tell him to come come over and uh, and use yours instead, uh, because I assume uh, that's still true. You're in the in the same place. Glenn, ca can you hear us? Yes. 
Um, okay, so uh, may maybe you can um, sit at uh, one computer for the time um, and this computer is trying to reconnect because that's uh, what's probably going on right now. Well, so we're, we'll get back to that question um, again. Hello, it's Glenn. Hello, it's Chris. The connection has been dropped, but now we're back. And uh, well, okay. Uh, um, so I ask just the, the uh, next question, and uh, when Andy joins us back, um, uh, we'll ask him about Ron Paul again. Um, so uh, the the last question prepared by myself uh, is: uh, Why is English the language of liberty? Well, uh, yes, often people ask us to explain what we mean by the language of liberty, and we have uh, several parts to the answer. First of all, we say English is the language of liberty because at this point in history, if you know English, you have more opportunity, and therefore you have more freedom. It wasn't always this way, uh, especially in this part of the world, uh, not, not too long ago. If you wanted more opportunity, it was a good idea to study Russian. Uh, 20 or 30 years in the future, it may be different. Who knows? It might be, might be Chinese. But at this point in history, uh, English is the way to improve your life. So that's a, an important part. Another, uh, another meaning of the language of liberty is the, uh, the, the writings, the documents that were the basis of not only the U.S. government and the U.S. culture, but many other countries around the world. Uh, so in our programs, we uh, spend a lot of time discussing uh, the writings the, uh, and the, the uh, thoughts of these, uh, quote, Western thinkers uh, that, that have, have influenced the development of the U.S. government and so much of Western civilization. Uh, another example of the language of liberty is um, uh, the principles of economics. Uh, if you understand how free markets work, uh, if you understand the value of entrepreneurship, you will have more opportunity in life and therefore more freedom. And I think uh, Andy has some thoughts on that, too. I'm not sure if he's connected with us, though. Uh, he's not connected right now, and I ask you using text, uh, but I, mm, I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, great. Uh, so, if, uh, if, you can, uh, if you can see uh, yes, Andy second. now. Uh, yes, I will give him my headset. Hello? Hello. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, sorry, I lost my uh, connection there. Uh, so please uh, continue. All right. On the uh, yes, the I think Glenn already mentioned that we think uh, English uh, gives you gives you more opportunity in life. It's the global uh, language. I don't think uh, Chinese will ever overtake English. Certainly not in the next uh, twenty years or so. But um, <clears throat> also, we believe that the, uh, the, the concepts of uh, individual liberty were first sort of promoted, especially in the Western world, uh, in the English language. And uh, the first uh, major revolt uh, against uh, a king uh, accusing him of being a tyrant uh, and, a, and a murderer happened in, uh, in England in uh, 1649, when the British uh, uh, executed their king, Charles I. And then the, the philosophers who came after this, who, um, who promoted this idea of uh, individual uh, liberty, like uh, John Locke, who came up with the concept that uh, you are the owner of your own body, that it's not uh, the king, uh, the government that owns your body, but uh, you yourself are the owner. And as a result, you are also the owner of whatever it is that your body produces. So your labor, your work. 
if you make a table, that table becomes your result of that. So all these all these concepts uh, originated. Uh, maybe they didn't originate there, but they were first uh, articulated and formulated uh, philosophically in England. And uh, the Glorious Revolution was a great example of uh, and the beginning of uh, true sort of parliamentary uh, democracy. And then later on, uh, John Stuart Mill came up with the concept of individual sovereignty. So not only are you the owner of your of your body, but you're also the ruler of your own life and of your own person, and that there is no sovereign above you. So individual sovereignty says that the sovereignty uh, ends with you. There's none uh, other. You can determine uh, the course of your life, and you can make the major decisions in your life. Because of that, he was also the promoter of uh, feminism, because he recognized that if I give the individual the right to uh, sovereignty, uh, then I have to give the equal right to both men and women. And that's, uh, that's where the philosophical basis for equality of men and women uh, first uh, arose, at least uh, philosophically speaking. So, yes, uh, and that's why we're promoting English. Uh, it's an international language. It's the only international language uh, that I know. It is actually taught uh, in many places as a subject uh, in, in English as an international language. And uh, these days, when you know English, uh, you can travel uh, around the whole world as we do. And uh, you don't really need uh, to speak another language. You can actually afford to be American and speak only one language. <laughs> Uh, and while you're with us, uh, Andy, uh, could you uh, answer again the question about uh, Ron Paul? Ah, Ron Paul, yes. <clears throat> yes, I said he's definitely the most famous politician that is promoting uh, libertarian ideas and is promoting uh, individualism and uh, especially small governments. <clears throat> uh, as as Language of Liberty Institute, we, we don't uh, promote uh, anarchy. We think that may be a, um, an, an objective in the long-term future, but uh, for now we would be happy if we can get uh, just smaller governments uh, with the reduced cost, reduced interference uh, in our lives and uh, increased freedom. And so Ron Paul has made that, uh, that case uh, very well. Uh, probably better than any other politician that I know, and he has made it uh, in America, but uh, the message has gone around the world, and everywhere we go, people ask us uh, about Ron Paul. I also said that as an institute, <clears throat> we don't support any particular uh, political party, and uh, but we support and we applaud all individuals uh, who are engaged in promoting uh, ideas of freedom, ideas of individualism, ideas of uh, free markets. So, in that respect, I have, um, I have all the admiration uh, for Ron Paul for what he has done, for what he has achieved, and I wish him and his uh, son, who is also involved now in politics, uh, and I wish uh, both of them uh, all the best in, in, their, in their careers and with their decisions. And you're listening to Contestatia Internet Radio. Uh, this is a live show, uh, Guest of the Month, with two guests this month, uh, Glenn Kripe and Andy Eichen of the Language of Liberty Institute. Uh, and uh, as this is a, a live hearing, you may, um, all, all of you uh, who have a Skype account or a telephone, uh, can call us and ask your questions on air uh, or comment. Uh, we invite you, we encourage you to do so um, by uh, dialing 222-195-321, I repeat 222-195-321, uh, or using Skype, uh, in which case uh, you call the username contestatia.com. Uh, and there is a question from chat, which is at uh, chatczat.contestatia.com uh, from Uwe. Uh, there is uh, uh, over 11% uh, inflation in uh, Mozambique, where, um, where you had a Liberty English camp uh, uh, this year. And uh, uh, how were your ideas and uh, your coming to Mozambique received there, um, given that fact, and the fact that a neighboring country is a very socialist uh, Zimbabwe? 
uh, and uh, uh, Republic of South Africa, uh, where they have um, more and more statism now nowadays. Well, Mozambique has had a very checkered uh, history. Uh, it received its independence from Portugal in 1975. And uh, the Mozambicans themselves always remind us that uh, they received their independence from a dictatorship, uh, not from a democracy like uh, England or France. And this, this has had, uh, I think, a fairly negative uh, effect on the Mozambican development. And it was only sort of in... 1990-1992 uh, time frame that they became a more open and more more democratic. This was after the fall of the Soviet Union, of course, when they no longer received any any support from over there. That they had to stand on their own two feet. And um, yes, inflation is is a problem not in Mozambique. It's a problem everywhere. But the fact that Moz that the Zimbabwe. Uh, is the is a neighbor uh, the Mozambicans are very well aware of what happens when you uh, continue to just uh, print money and when you have to issue 100 trillion dollar notes uh, which uh, barely buy you a loaf of bread uh, so they are fully aware of of that danger and they are uh, they are looking well maybe not the government but uh, the people are looking for solutions and uh, the ideas that we propose to them, and we talk to over 250 young people, uh, the ideas at the beginning, they are a little bit skeptical, but uh, after a while they say, yes, uh, this, this, this could be an alternative that's, uh, that's worth trying. And we, we, were in a, we were in a province called Zambezi, which uh, when the Portuguese were in charge was the richest province in Mozambique. It's a problem for entrepreneurs, for people wanting to do things and uh, are hardworking. And today, um, Zambezi is the poorest province in uh, Mozambique. And uh, we asked, we had, we had good discussions with the people there and asked them, why is it that uh, now you are the poorest and uh, 30, 40 years ago you were the richest in, in Mozambique? Just, just one example, um, uh, Mozambique has beautiful cashew nuts, and uh, before, Mozambique was the world's leader in cashew nuts. They were the number one when it came to exporting nuts, but today the number one is Vietnam, and uh, Mozambique has lost that uh, place and uh, the incentive, and it's, it's almost difficult to find cashew nuts uh, in a shop in Mozambique because yeah, they, they grow on, on land. Uh, land in Mozambique is all owned by the government. It cannot be owned by individuals, so there's very little incentive. Uh, you can get uh, the right to use your land to, to grow uh, food or to build a house. You get the right to use, but uh, you never get the legal right to actually own the land. Uh, the constitution at the moment forbids that. And that is a major uh, disincentive. And uh, when people are not sure that they can gain, that they can retain uh, the, the, the fruit of their labor, then they have less motivation to try, they have less motivation to do something. Uh, it's much easier to sit around and wait for the government to give you something. Uh, in Mozambique, the government is very poor. I think Mozambique is probably the fourth, fifth poorest country in, in Africa. So um, there's not, um, not much for the government to, to give uh, to the people. Uh, so they realize that if they want to improve their standard of living, and uh, the young people certainly do, and, uh, and the young people today have more education than their parents ever had, and uh, this education, they say, okay, why do we have this education? What do we do with it now? Uh, if the education does not help us to improve our standard of living, then uh, what's the point uh, of, of uh, going to school, of learning something? And so they realize... All these, these combinations, uh, uh, the entrepreneurship uh, aspect, the political freedom aspect, the property rights aspect, the rule of law aspect, they, they can see now that you need these things to be in place uh, in order to improve your lot, in order to improve uh, your standard of living, in order to increase uh, prosperity. And one of the things that we always notice when we go to Africa there is always talk about reduction of poverty. 
everybody wants to reduce poverty. Even the United Nations has poverty reduction goals, uh, the Millennium Development Goals, for instance. The objective always seems to be to reduce poverty. Uh, to me, they are asking the wrong question. To me, they should be the objective should be to increase wealth, not to reduce poverty. And when you focus on how can I increase the wealth of the country or different thoughts that come to mind. When you think of reducing poverty, the thought that comes to mind is, well, somebody else should help me to reduce my poverty. And the way that they should do that is by giving me money. Uh, so you have all these rich people in, in, the, in the world and they should give me money. But uh, when you turn the question around, I think, are you still online? Uh, certainly. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, but when you when you turn the question around and you think about how can I increase my wealth, a whole different type of uh, thoughts that comes into your mind, and you you become more creative, you become more innovative, you you think of opportunities, you think uh, of uh, ways that you can do something that can make things better, rather than just sitting around and waiting for somebody to come and give you money and reduce poverty. And so we're, we're trying to change that whole mindset around. And it's also one of the reasons why our, our target audience are mainly the young people, so the 20 to 25 year olds. Uh, because uh, before, before you are 20, well, you are, you are under the control of your parents to start with, and then you, you go to school. And uh, after school, after university, you get a job, and then you are under the control of your boss and of your employer. So there's really only that uh, few years where you are at university where they actually encourage you to think independently, to think for yourself, uh, to think of new and different ways. Uh, people are still idealistic. Uh, how can we change the world for the better? And that is the that is the age group uh, that we target and that we want to we want to catch uh, uh, and they want to catch our imagination on how to improve their life they have their own ideas on how to do that and that's great we are not here to tell them how they should do it we are just telling them that they can do it and that they should do it the how is different from place to place and from individual to individual we are all individuals we are all unique there is no person like you in the world, not even your twin brother or sister. So you are a unique individual. You have been given special talents. You have special desires, special uh, wants and needs and ideas. Uh, and your mission in life is to find out uh, what is your potential and then to try. And that may not suit everybody, but uh, we, we are saying that uh, this is... Uh, the concept that you should embrace uh, to have your, your, your own individuality and to fulfill the potential that that individuality has. And uh, to us, that is always a very great message to, uh, to say to young people. And um, everywhere we go, in different cultures, different backgrounds, different religions, uh, different uh, standards of living, the, uh, the young people tend to appreciate that message. And if, if, they, if they can remember that the future is up to them, not to somebody to give it to them, to hand it to them on a, on a silver platter or even uh, a wooden platter, uh, then I think we have done our, our job and we have uh, fulfilled the mission that we set out to do. And that is to, uh, uh, to help people to help themselves rather than to uh, sit around and wait for uh, governments to solve all the problems of the world. Even in the Western world now, even in Europe now, you hear many people say, well, when there, whenever there's a problem, uh, why doesn't the government do something about this? And uh, so with the young people, we're trying to change that mindset that always is looking for the government to solve the problems. Uh, we have the capacity, uh, we have the incentive, uh, and it's even better when we solve the problem the way that we want to solve it rather than waiting for a third party to come and solve it for us. Because sometimes we don't like the solutions either, right? So when we have uh, 
uh, buy-in into the solution, when we have a say in how the solution is uh, framed, how the solution is implemented, uh, then we are also happier with the outcome of that solution. And if we can do that um, in different ways, in different places, by different people, then that's that's fine. And uh, that will reduce uh, the interference of the government and will also reduce uh, the cost of the government because the cost of government around the world now uh, is too high. Many countries are going broke because uh, the governments are going broke. They can no longer afford to pay for all the promises that they have made to their uh, electorates. And uh, at the end of the day, government is about redistribution of wealth. It is not about creation. And uh, our objective is to change that mind mindset and to focus on the creation of wealth rather than the distribution of it. Uh, well, I think, I think most of our listeners agree, agree with that. Um, and um, there are two questions sent by... Uh, Philip from Bydgoszcz, uh, uh, the first one you, uh, for the most part, already answered. Uh, uh, Philip asks for more details about Liberty English camps. He's especially interested in um, what activities are people engaged in. And um, to give it uh, another aspect different from what you already said, I'll combine it with a question, uh, with another question from uh, Chad, uh, which is... Um, well, it is a known fact that uh, libertarians uh, are mostly very individualistic, uh, uh, introverted, uh, and um, they, their social skills uh, tend to be uh, lower at some ages at least. Uh, so, uh, how do you encourage them to interact, to talk to each other and to... Um, and to cooperate, uh, to form a basis for uh, further cooperation uh, when they leave the uh, events that uh, they attend, organized by you. <laughs> Those are great questions. Thank you, Philip, if you're listening. And I hope you come to the camp, and Chad as well. I hope you come to camps and see. And uh, so I will, I'm happy to describe that. And by the way, our camps so far in Poland have always been uh, I think it's seven camps at this point. They've always been in in the southern part, and and so uh, Bitgost is uh, in the north. So uh, maybe we can come to your area next year. So um, at the yes, um, <clears throat> most of our camps are designed with a main goal of getting students to interact, to practice their English. Uh, sometimes we can't do that. Sometimes in Brazil and Mozambique, we had a hundred students in the, the room. We were in a big auditorium. So we organized that camp in a different way. But most a typical liberty camp, a typical four or five day camp uh, has a smaller number. It has 25 to 40 students because we want everyone to know one another. We want to have everyone to uh, able to spend time together and, and get in conversation. We want to hear everyone's opinion. Our students are not beginners in English. Most of them are not fluent. On a scale from one to five, they would probably be about three. So, in other words, they're competent, but they typically lack the conversation practice. They typically lack the experience of living in English-speaking countries. Uh, so, the camp atmosphere is designed to encourage the interaction. Uh, the uh, there are several ways we do that. Uh, one is by keeping the number small, of course. Another is by forming small discussion groups, uh, five, six, seven people, and we uh, we meet several times during the week with our discussion groups, and the uh, the discussion leader knows that he or she should not talk but should ask questions to make students talk. Uh, other activities are uh, debates. We usually have two debates, two different evenings. We have the students uh, form debate teams and debate a, uh, you might say, a libertarian or a philosophical question. Uh, I can give you examples if we have more time. Other activities, uh, we um, uh, have workshops. And on the final day of camp, we allow about three hours for the student teams to present their project a project might be starting a business. A project might be designing a political activism campaign. Uh, 
one of the rules is that every student must uh, must participate. And for some students, this is the first time they've ever given a presentation to anybody about anything. For even, other students... Even in any language, not, not necessarily in English, right? Yes, that's right. And for almost everyone, even if they have experience, they don't have the experience in English. So it's a, it's a learning, uh, a practice experience for everyone. Well, that's also, the on the final night, and again, this is a, typically a, a camp where, you know, where we're out in, in the country, uh, in, a, in the woods or in the mountains or by a lake. Uh, we have campfires, we have singing, we have talent show. Uh, so it's a very social uh, kind of week. Uh, now, your, the, the second question about, about um, personalities, let me see if I can restate that. Libertarians are, tend to be individualistic, introverted, sometimes lower uh, social skills or less developed social skills. How do we encourage them to interact and cooperate? Did I get that right? Well, I think that you've given um, excellent examples how, how you do it. Uh, and yeah, yeah that, that's, uh, that's the idea behind this question, I believe. Well, if, not, it, it, if not, then we'll be corrected on chat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I really like that question. Um, and I'll, I'll give you... Uh, a funny answer and uh, a more serious answer. The funny answer is we really love quiet, indiv uh, quiet introverted people because they don't talk too much <laughs> and we can talk. <laughs> But no, the serious answer is that, um, you know, a Andy and I have many, many years of experience with consulting and with training. So we have a lot of techniques for encouraging people we we recognize this we understand this and we have we and our colleagues uh are are very skilled at uh, drawing out people who are uh shy uh, both andy and i speak other languages and we know that it's not easy to learn a foreign language we andy and i Uh, have our moments of shyness as well, our moments of introversion as well. Uh, we understand what that's like, but we have more practice in overcoming that or dealing with that. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, we, we pay extra attention to the people who seem to be shy, and we often find that those people actually know more English than some of the others. They simply need the opportunity. They, they need a sympathetic listener. Um, sometimes the person who is the quietest is the one who, at the end of the week, gives the most outstanding presentation. Or, in the talent show, suddenly starts singing opera. We've had some amazing experiences. So, w one of the great pleasures of our our. I'm going to say our job. We don't see it as a job. It's our pleasure. It's our passion. But one of the, the greatest pleasures is to watch individuals and to help and to, to get to know them during the week and watch them change, uh, watch them de be, de develop more confidence and, um, and, and, to, and improve their English and and. Uh, please continue. Are you with us? Okay. Uh, uh, yes. So I was uh, going to stop at that point, unless you have another question about well, that. Uh, no, another question is about something else, actually. Um, okay. Also from Philip, uh, uh, what methods of teaching about uh, entrepreneurship uh, do you use and why are they effective? Sorry, sorry. And, uh, just can you just repeat that question? Uh, sure. Um, what methods of teaching about entrepreneurship do you use, and why are they effective? <clears throat> okay. Well, how do we know that they're effective? Uh, when you start your multi-million-dollar enterprise, then we know they've been very effective. <laughs> so the, uh, I mean, entrepreneurship, like I said, mentioned before, uh, it's a. Um, It's a set of skills. It's not one individual skill. You need to have many, many different skills. And the way that we teach it uh, in class is through an, an actual uh, example, a simulation, if you like. 
uh, almost every entrepreneur who requires money and which entrepreneur doesn't uh, will need to write a business plan at some stage uh, in his or her uh, career. And uh, normally these business plans are needed to convince the bank, to convince investors, to convince uh, maybe your family and friends uh, to give you money for your enterprise. You have to tell them what uh, your business is all about, why is your idea so great and so wonderful, and how are you going to make uh, pots of gold and lots of money. So therefore, uh, we, we first of all, we encourage the students to generate I ideas. Innovation is the single most important word that you can uh, learn today. Uh, innovation is required in whatever you do, in your own life, in the life of your business, uh, even in the life of your country. Innovation is the difference between winning and losing. So innovation means doing something that hasn't been done before. So we're trying to encourage the students to come up with ideas that are, that are new, certainly new in their particular environment, and then to write a business plan. And uh, Glenn and I, and sometimes other teachers, we pretend to be the investors and the students present their ideas to us and try to convince us uh, to part uh, with our money. This is a game, of course, but uh, it simulates a real-life situation. In real life, you also have to do that. And uh, normally, we try and uh, create teams of uh, four or five uh, individuals, four or five uh, members, and uh, they have to work together to create a business plan and to, uh, to present it uh, at the end of the camp. In real life, you also uh, there are very few things that you can do entirely by yourself. So you also have to work with people, people that sometimes you know, sometimes you don't know in advance. So therefore, this concept of um, uh, working together, so the, the technical word these days is called collaboration. We collaborate, we cooperate, uh, we take one idea. So the first task is for the group to decide on uh, which idea to, to accept. So the four or five members of the team have to agree, have to accept that uh, this is the best idea that we have. So that's the idea that we're going to turn into a business. And then they have to look at every aspect uh, of making this idea a reality and uh, present it to us, uh, quote, investors, unquote, uh, to see are we convinced would we part with our money and invest in this project. If you have the money yourself, of course, you, you don't need to do that. But it's still always a good idea to put down on paper what you intend to do uh, because uh, putting it down on paper sort of focuses the mind. It forces you to think things through. And uh, it's, a, um, it's a sort of self-imposed uh, discipline, even when you don't need other people's money. But when you do need other people's money, it is essential. It's, uh, it's uh, mandatory to, to have a business plan to convince uh, these people to, get, to give them, uh, to, uh, to give you their money. And uh, so that's a skill that we, that we teach in a real life sort of simulated um, uh, situation. So this is about serious stuff and now a question about less serious stuff uh, which is the first uh, one of the questions sent uh, by Marius. Um, uh, please name a few uh, games and pastimes organized for participants of Liberty uh, English Camps. Uh, just name a few and well uh, just to get uh, to give us the idea of uh, what activities of this kind uh, are present there. Well, the the um, the most common activity uh, besides the the present, I try to avoid the word lecture because lecture sounds like something like um, one person speaking and everybody listening passively. Sometimes with a big group, we have to do that. But what we prefer, what we try uh, normally, is to have interactive. Uh, we try to have students participate in everything possible. We try to avoid le lecture. Uh, but the <clears throat> apart from these presentations, these interactive lectures, we have uh, the workshops uh, for the students. They spend one or two hours or more every day working on their presentations, on their projects. That is 
the major activity in addition to the, uh, let's say, the, the teaching part. I, I mentioned ready debates, talent shows. Uh, we always leave time for, for fun things. Uh, there's, there's swimming or hiking or uh, uh, campfires. Uh, so there's a lot of, it, it's a very informal atmosphere. Uh, there's a, a lot of inf- interaction. The, the, the teachers, the staff, the discussion leaders, all, uh, you know, we, we're all sleeping in the same building. We're all eating together and we're uh, sharing social activities together as well. Um, we often include some typical activities like, uh, like ice makers, or energizers. Um, occasionally, we, um, we might have a discussion about uh, game theory and uh, we might have students play, a, play a, some sort of game uh, to understand the ideas uh, about uh, risk or cooperation or competition. Great. Um, well, another question from uh, Marius is uh, that uh, many people claim that their lives were transformed by Liberty English camps. Uh, could you tell a few? By a few, I mean uh, that's uh, how much time we have uh, left uh, uh, because there are uh, a few questions uh, after this one. Um, I mean, two, one from each of you, uh, stories in which the changes observable in individuals were tru- truly remarkable after uh, the Liberty English camps. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I mean, uh, very often uh, in almost every camp, sometimes immediately after the camp or sometimes uh, a few days or a couple of weeks uh, later in, a, in an email or Facebook, people will tell us that uh, the camp has uh, changed their life. And this is always uh, very rewarding and very very satisfying. And uh, when we when we ask them, hey, how did we change uh, your life? The the most uh, common response uh, goes something like this: uh, When when I the students before before I come to the camp, I was told by my parents, by my teachers, by my friends, by all the people who have influence on my life that uh, I should conform, I should do what everybody else does, I should not rock the boat, uh, I should uh, accept other people's opinions, and so on and so on. What we teach, and what I think is what changes people's lives, is when you tell them that, number one, you are an individual, never forget that. And as an individual, you are unique, and you think in a unique way, and you have unique desires, you have unique uh, needs, you have uh, unique talents, and you need to find a unique way to fulfill that potential. And it, it is that, it is that, um, uh, that idea, that, that concept, it's, uh, it's like a, a light bulb that goes on in, in, your, in your brain when you say, uh, well, I don't have to do what everybody else tells me. And I can make my own decisions regarding my own life. I don't need to conform to this uh, social pressure or the pressure it is that is being on students. And uh, in different cultures, of course, this is more pronounced than in others. But um, in some of the more traditional cultures, this pressure is very real and uh, it's uh, it's palpable. You can you can almost feel it. Uh, the the students. Um, would not uh, say something that uh, that would be out of place or uh, or just because they wanted to say it. And uh, this has changed many people's lives. Uh, I was invited to speak at, at an economics conference in Shanghai uh, like this year. And uh, we had about 50, 50 Chinese uh, high school and uh, university students. And we talked about uh, critical and creative thinking. And they said to me, well, if we do what you tell us to do, we will all go to jail. <laughs> because this, this idea that I can think uh, of, my, of, uh, of my own, that I have my own thoughts, uh, I can be creative, which means I'm thinking of something that has never been thought of before, uh, that concept uh, is, uh, is, is foreign. And it's when the students realize that they actually can do that, there's nothing stopping them from doing that, that is the moment that they feel that their lives have been impacted and that their lives have been changed. 
Well, you haven't given uh, specific uh, examples of individuals, but uh, uh, I think uh, you can read them on their blogs or maybe on your website. There are some testimonials, uh, and they be found there. Yes, I think the the best examples I can give. Uh, some of our students have been inspired to uh, form uh, to start new clubs and new activities, new clubs. You mentioned earlier the uh, Polish American Leadership Academy. Uh, that's uh, an example. Uh, um, in fact, the way we have found uh, of opening new camps in new countries. is by partnering with former students. So when they actually say we transform their lives, they actually implement their, their inspiration and their, their knowledge by starting camps, by starting new NGOs, uh, by translating books, by going to conferences. Uh, so we are happy to think that we have a, a small part in, in creating that. Uh, excellent. Uh, so the next question is, uh, uh, what do you think about the Free State Project? I, I think it's a very, very clever idea. Uh, I have visited the, the people in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, I went to one of their conferences. They, they have um, at least two every year. Uh, one is usually in February. It's way too cold. Um, I'm a, a warm weather person, so I'm, I have to say I'm not really tempted to live in New Hampshire. I, most of my life I grew up in cold places, and I'm happy to live in warm places now. So I will probably not be joining the Free State Project physically, but I'm with them in spirit because I, I, I think that they have a very clever idea. They, uh, they enjoy, if you go there, I hope everyone does, go there and go to a conference and meet them. They are very happy, very excited about having their community, uh, about having libertarian businesses and libertarian neighbors, uh, as well as people who are not. Uh, so... I think it's a very interesting idea. I, I encourage that kind of experimentation. Mm -hmm. yeah, great. Uh, and the last question from Marius uh, is, uh, which way of transforming a country towards freedom do you believe is better, uh, by forming a political party or grassroots lobbying efforts? <clears throat> I think they're both very important. Uh, I would add to forming a party, uh, maybe influencing a party, such as Ron Paul has done. Uh, forming a party is very, very difficult. Uh, if people can do that, that's good. Uh, but maybe I could change the question just slightly and maybe say political activity more generally instead of just forming a party. Uh, I think of, uh, I, I'm inspired by what Hayek wrote about the role of intellectuals and the role of politicians. Uh, Hayek advocated uh, trying to influence the intellectuals in society or the opinion leaders in society, uh, spreading, uh, spreading your ideas and uh, not spreading ideas that are just halfway ideas, but he called for um, a truly radical utopia uh, where you, you don't compromise your principles, you advocate that uh, a, a strong, principled version of the kind of uh, society, the kind of laws, the kinds of conditions that you would like, and then uh, the the politicians will follow. If you interest enough people, you start with the intellectuals. You, you, the intellectuals spread the ideas to to more people, and the politicians eventually, at least in Western democracies, that they listen and they follow. So I think that it's important. To the intellectual activity is important. I think the political activity is important. As I said earlier, I'm not a politician. I'm a teacher. Uh, so I advocate teaching. This is my way of trying to spread freedom. Uh, I think for everybody, the education is the key. The, we, have to, we all have to learn. We have to study. We have to improve ourselves. And those who are inclined toward political activity should pursue that. And those who are inclined toward uh, maybe organizing uh, grassroots activities uh, should do that. Some people are writers, some people are singers, some people are filmmakers, some people are journalists. Uh, everybody should do that. Uh, two quick questions uh, from chat. Um, the first one is from Raz Raz. 
Uh, what do you think about Bitcoin? Will it be more popular in the future? I'm going to, uh, yes, I'm going to pass that to Andy, and he didn't hear the question. It was about Bitcoin. Uh, what, what do you think about Bitcoin? Uh, where will it go in the future? Yes, hello. Yeah, Bitcoin and uh, any any similar similar uh, projects like this that uh, allow that allow electronic transactions uh, and retain uh, anonymity, because you know the the big advantage of cash is that uh, it allows an anonymous transaction that uh, the government is not uh, aware of. And now, with the financial legislation that is being prepared everywhere, with financial transaction taxes being talked about and so on, uh, the government wants to know everything that we do, including all the financial transactions, uh, how we earn our money, how we spend our money, and everything in between. Uh, products uh, such as Bitcoin uh, make that process harder for the government, and of course, uh, as such, uh, we applaud uh, any such uh, ventures and, and, and the implementation of these ideas. Mm. And uh, no, another question from chat uh, was asked by uh, Uwe. Um, what's the present status of the freedom movement uh, globally, uh, in your opinion? Uh, there are huge, um, well, um, there are huge uh, perturbances in societies in Europe, like in Spain and uh, in the USA, the Occupy uh, Wall Street movement, uh, where people demand uh, more government control uh, and they don't uh, uh, tend to be eager uh, to take uh, control in, of their lives and of their um, societies in their own hands. So, um, w where does it lead us? Yes, there seems to be a, a polarization happening. Um, there are some people who tend to ask for more government control. But uh, we notice uh, that there's, there's just um, an uh, equal, uh, equally potent movement away from government and towards freedom, especially among young people. Uh, among the older generations, yes, they have been made many promises by their politicians for over many years. And of course, now they no longer have the energy or the patience to uh, uh, to wait for the implementation of these promises. So yes, so they will ask. They say, if um, if we need more government control in order to deliver these promises, okay, then let's have more government control. It's not that they necessarily want this uh, government control, but they want the benefits that they expect from this government control. I think the young people today realize that. Uh, uh, these promises are empty promises that the, the money to deliver them uh, is not there. It, it cannot be produced out of magic, uh, which uh, was something that many, many people thought that, uh, well, money, money just comes uh, magically and we just uh, worry about how it's going to be distributed. But money has to be, or wealth, uh, money is just a representation of wealth and that wealth has to be created uh, by somebody. And the creation of that wealth is actually more important than the redistribution of that wealth. Because if there's no wealth to distribute, well, then nobody gets anything. And the uh, European uh, Union, especially now, uh, is realizing that uh, just uh, creating money uh, out of nothing and uh, distributing it uh, is not going to work in the long run. It's not sustainable. And that's why you have all these protests now. On the one hand, you have the protests that say, hey, you didn't give us what you promised. You're taking away. You're starting to take away instead of giving us. And uh, this concept of uh, the government always giving, the government cannot give unless it takes something first. And uh, taking, uh, I think we have reached the limit of government taking. And so the only way that the, the government can continue to give is to inflate the currency to print money, to maybe nationalize uh, profitable companies, uh, what we now call state capitalism. Uh, government is desperate finding ways uh, that they can continue to give without uh, increasing the, the take. Personally, I don't think that that's possible. And more and more young people are realizing that that is not possible. 
the welfare state is not sustainable. It uh, will have to collapse uh, sooner or later, and I believe uh, sooner rather than later. And uh, the young people are asking, hey, what, what do we do then? What's going to happen after the welfare state? And so therefore, uh, people are looking for alternatives and uh, we are telling them the, the, what, what these alternatives are. These alternatives are revolving around sound money, around uh, minimum government rather than more government, reduce the influence of government, reduce the cost of government, reduce the uh, interference, especially in productive business activities, reduce taxation, because taxation is a major disincentive. It, it punishes people. Uh, sure, that, that's that's uh, something that uh, no, no, nobody likes. I think uh, to um, to have oh, uh, taxes tax, tax, taxes raised. Uh, yes, and especially the young people. Well, uh, for sure, because all, old people don't, don't pay them; they receive uh, money from the state uh, uh, rather nowadays. Um, so, uh, that were all questions that were prepared by us or sent uh, by email or uh, that emerged on the chat. Uh, I've got one final question for a short answer for uh, each of you, uh, a surprise question to end mm -hmm. with. Uh, you travel a lot around the world. What was your most surprising encounter with a foreign custom place or person? The most surprising encounter with a foreign custom place. Mm. Well, I've had quite a quite a few of those uh, because I've 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 been to 80, 83 countries, and uh, I I find in, in every country I find something unique, something uh, uh, that's special about it. Uh, usually, what's special or what what I remember the most uh, are the people that I meet there, and I I try not to make comparisons. Very often, people ask me, say, what's uh, what's the best country that you've been to, and I I try to avoid these sort of questions because I enjoy every country where I am. I enjoy the uh, the, the benefits, uh, the advantages, uh, the the good things of that country, and uh, when I come to another country, I I do the same there. Uh, there are many unusual uh, uh, customs that, that we've come across. Uh, the one, may, maybe, maybe the one that um, uh, in in Kenya they have uh, they have a, a restaurant called Carnivores, where you can you can try every meat that is available in Africa, from from uh, giraffes to camels to lions to whatever, and uh, it's a it, it's a great experience uh, to uh, to taste all the different meats of animals that you normally only hear about or see about uh, but uh, never get to taste <laughs> so uh, uh, Glenn has the, the same question uh, yes please that, that, that would be the last uh, uh, thing except for saying goodbyes and some final remarks okay I'll try to get <laughs> that, that's a wonderful question and I could talk for hours about this because we have so many great memories and great experiences I, I encourage I hope uh, your your listeners will uh, decide to look at our newsletter because we tried to capture some of this in our newsletter you can if you don't already receive it you can go to our website languageofliberty.org there's a, a link on our homepage where you can join our uh, mailing list and um, I think the one of the great beauties of foreign travel is that you have these surprising moments. They are, they surprise you because they're different. They challenge your assumptions. They challenge your ideas. They challenge uh, what you think about your way of life, and they, they make you question your own your own uh, your own practices, your own country, and you learn from it. So whether it's um, kidnapping of brides in Kyrgyzstan or whether it's killing goats for a beach barbecue in Africa or, uh, you know, different foods, different. Uh, there's a reason why people do the, all these things and their reasons are, are good reasons. And it's uh, I, I enjoy learning about it. So um, since I think it's time to say goodbye, yeah. I will. um and if you have any final thoughts, then please uh, tell them now uh, and uh, then uh, say your goodbyes, uh, both of you. Before you do that, uh, I'll say that uh, it's been great to have uh, both of you on Contestacja in Gośmiesiąca uh, and um, with listeners 
uh, I'll hear you next month. Uh, there is a there is a, a caller ca calling us, but we can't answer that because we have to finish. Uh, so um, hear you next month uh, in Polish. I, I think um, that's for listeners and for you. Thanks again and um, have lo lots lots of success with your uh, projects. Thank you for inviting us, Christoph, and thanks, everybody, for your good questions. And I will just make a quick comment. Uh, you asked me earlier about uh, being motivated or being inspired to do these activities. Before I read Hayek and Bastiat, before I read Ayn Rand, before I read Harry Brown, I was influenced by my family. I have a fantastic family. Uh, I have wonderful brothers and sister. Uh, my brother Dean and my mother are listening now from Richmond, Virginia in the U.S. The greatest influence in my life and my inspiration has been my mother. She taught me, she and my family taught me to think independently, to be an individual, to pursue my dreams. And that's what I'm doing. So thank you very much, Mom and Dean. Thank you, Christoph. And now I'll pass to Andy. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Glenn, and uh, thank you, Chris, and thanks to all your listeners. Um, it's been a pleasure to be with you this evening, and I hope we can do it again sometime. I certainly hope so, too. Um, you're um, welcome to uh, recommend Contestacia to others and to listen uh, well, um, to learn Polish and listen and to listen uh, <laughs> uh, hearings that are in English, which may happen from time to time. Um, so for our English-speaking listeners, occasional listeners, um, well, um, subscribe to our fan page on Facebook uh, and you should uh, in this way be able to stay informed about uh, any uh, upcoming uh, shows in English. So that's all. Uh, I'm passing uh, the air. Well, uh, Hugo, Marcin Hugo Kosinski is coming on air with his show, the main show of the week in Polish. Bye. Chimy!